I'm your host, Michael Petch, and uh, joining me shortly it will be Ethan Recho, who is the um, technical marketing manager at Desktop Metal, and we will be discussing uh, AM 2.0 and also um, talking about how to make a switch to that particular platform. If everything's okay now and you're ready to go? Yeah, let's, let's get into it. So I thought that we would start by talking a little bit about Adam 2.0, exactly what it is. Some of you may be familiar with what this uh, idea is, how Desktop Metal is pioneering it. it. Many of you are probably not. So let's start off by talking about what is Additive 2.0. And of course, to do this, we first need to start by understanding what was Additive 1.0. Today, we're gonna specifically be talking about metals, uh, but when we're looking at traditional metal 3D printing, we're really talking about these lasered powdered metal 3D printers. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with these systems. We're talking these DMOS systems, these SOS machines. But we at Desktop Metal, when we looked at this industry, uh, we really felt that these machines were very similar to what a 1970s punch card computer looked like. Uh, I personally didn't get to use these machines, but from what I've heard from my coworkers and, and other colleagues who have, they were these very, very large machines. They took up entire rooms. They had these highly trained, dedicated operators to run them. Uh, you know, an engineer or mathematician would bring their job to this operator. They would run it for them. A few weeks later, they'd deliver the results. This is really how we felt that these, uh, these laser powder metal 3D printers were. They're these large machines. They're difficult to use. They're very expensive. And that to the everyday engineer and the, to the everyday designer, it was really just not a very accessible technology. Uh, of course, you know, because of these challenges, they really led to limited applications. Uh, these high part costs, slow processing times really led to these very, very specific low volume applications. We saw lots of applications of laser powder bed fusion in the aerospace and the medical device industry, really because these industries were able to stomach these high part costs. They're almost always producing parts in low volume that they're really able to take advantage of these technologies where, I mean, for, for those industries, that technology is great, but for the everyday engineer or the everyday designer, it really just hasn't been accessible. It hasn't been something that has been able to be leveraged. To date, we really feel that, uh, that metal 3D printing has really barely scratched the surface. Uh, when it comes to prototyping and tooling, that legacy technology has really just been too industrial and too expensive uh, to justify producing parts of metal. When it comes to actual volume production and producing hundreds or thousands of parts uh, per week or per month, it's really just not fast or cheap enough uh, to justify actually producing and use parts in volume. Uh, of course, we're not just here to talk about the challenges of traditional uh, additive manufacturing. We're here to talk about the future. And we really feel that at, Des at Desktop Metal that the additive manufacturing industry is at this inflection point. And this inflection point is really talking about additive manufacturing 2.0, where we're really justifying these volume production of end use parts uh, via area wide printing processes. So, additive manufacturing 2.0 is really this transition from low volume production, very, very specialized, very, very high part costs to very, very high volume production, uh, producing hundreds, thousands of parts with much lower uh, part costs, which makes a wide variety of new applications available. Uh, AM 2.0 is really being driven by these two main themes. The first being accessibility. Part costs and the ability to produce parts has become far more accessible and far easier. So parts that maybe were too expensive or too difficult to produce in the past to be justified can now be printed with these new low cost, easy to use metal 3D printing technologies. The other driver of added manufacturing 2.0 is this idea of high volume manufacturing. Uh, metal 3D printing used to be this very, very niche manufacturing process that was really only used to produce maybe one or a handful of parts, uh, but can now we can use this technology to produce hundreds thousands of parts per week uh, to really justify end use high volume manufacturing. Uh, Desktop Metal has a few different metal 3D printers today. Just gonna review uh, the three of them here on screen that are really delivering on this AM 2.0 mission. The studio system on the left is the printer you see behind me uh, to my right here. Uh, this is our office friendly metal 3D printer. This is for lower volume. Uh, it's for prototypes, one-off parts, replacement parts, but it's metal 3D printing. Very, very low cost metal 3D printing. Very, very, very easy to use. I'm sitting at my desk right now here in, at Desktop Metal. This machine, I'm running it all day long right behind me. Super easy to use, super safe. Uh, it's great for the office environment. 
Then we have our binder jetting systems. You can see the shaft system uh, over my left shoulder here. That's great for batch production of fully dense parts. Now we're starting to ramp up uh, the quantity of parts that we're able to produce. Uh, delivers these isotropic material properties, so you get excellent uh, you know, material properties that you need and expect, but it's still a very accessible system. It's a turnkey system allowing for volume production, uh, meaning that it's very, very easy to get up and running with this bioenergetic system. To the extreme, we have the production system. This is really for delivering high speed mass production of metal parts. It's designed to go on the factory floor. You're still getting these beautiful isotropic material properties, but now you're getting this true speed required for mass production and you're utilizing these very, very low cost metal powders to allow you to produce parts at incredibly low cost. So just a quick recap of the three systems that we're gonna be talking about today. Studio System 2, it's really great for office friendly metal 3D printing. It's great for these low volume applications, things like prototyping, jigs and fixtures, tooling. It's really designed for the office environment. So there's no hazardous powders, no dangerous lasers, and you have very minimal facility investment required to get one of these systems up and running. It's, it's probably the easiest system uh, to get up and running with metal 3D printing. It has this very easy to, to use support structures, automated workflow, and these easy to change materials that come in cartridges, similar to an inkjet printer. Uh, today we have 17.4 pH, uh, 316L stainless steel, H13 tool steel, copper, and 4140 low alloy steel. The shop system, just a quick recap here. It's great for batch production of dense, customer-ready metal parts that are designed for machine shops. Uh, it's scalable, cost-effective. It's great for this medium volume and use parts. It allows you to greatly reduce your lead times because of course there's no tooling involved at any point. Uh, print speeds up to 10 times faster than laser powder bed fusion, enabling you to print hundreds of parts per day. Uh, very high quality parts, dense, near net shape, right out of the furnace, enabling you to produce these end use parts. And again, it's a turnkey optimized solution, allowing it to be very, very easy to get up and running because all those parameters are defined for you, allowing you to start printing beautiful parts, you know, the same day the printer's up installed. Then again, on the extreme, we have the production system. This is a large industrial machine. It's really designed for high speed mass production of metal parts. We're producing, you know, up to tens of thousands of parts per year, even millions of parts per year, depending on the geometry, 100, 100 times faster than laser powder bed fusion, thanks to this process called single pass jetting. The part costs are, are competitive with conventional manufacturing. We have incredible repeatability, thanks to some anti-ballistic technology, as well as real-time optical print bed inspections, things that you're gonna need for these production systems, and has the widest material compatibility, thanks to this inert printing environment, as well as an open material platform. So the ability to put whatever materials you want to into the system, uh, you can use systems, uh, powders from any of your metal powder suppliers uh, that you can purchase powders from today. Uh, just to give you an idea of the technologies that we're really competing with when we're compared to traditional manufacturing, you can see on the bottom there, that's the studio system. It's great for quantities, maybe one to 100, parts that you would be machining, parts that you would be using maybe laser powder bed fusion for. When it comes to the shop system, and, and on the right there, that's the P1, that's a different version of the production system, but that's great for maybe one, uh, 100 to 100,000 parts per year. It can compete with things like extrusion, investment, casting, other casting methods. It's really great for ramping up that production value. And then on the very, very extreme, you can see uh, the production system. That's great for high volume production, uh, really competing with metal injection molding, die casting, and, and things like stamping. So I just wanted to quickly give an example of a part from each one of our systems, just to give you an idea of some real world applications that these things are using for today. The first part I want to show you is this spring holder hanger. This is from one of our customers, Prezioso Francesco in Italy. Uh, they are a stamping and sheet metal company. This is part of a, a paneling machine. The part's coupled with a gear through a spring. It allows this arm to rotate. Currently, they are buying this part from a vendor uh, that was ha having this part be machined. So if the vendor had the part in stock, they were having to buy it. Uh, it was taking about seven days to receive the part, even longer if they needed to be custom machined. So they were looking to take this part that they were originally buying and see if they could metal 3D print it instead. It was costing them about 60 euros. They were also having some issues with this part being having some failure. You can see some tear out stress here in the geometry. So they're really looking to replace this part with a metal 3D printed geometry. So of course, here are the metal 3D printed parts. You can see them on the right there and they really found four key benefits to printing this geometry. First, it was stronger. They were able to modify the design to add that rib without changing any tooling, without changing any programming, just modify the CAD file, 
upload on the printer, and in a couple of days, they have their new parts. Faster, in just four days, they were able to manufacture six different samples. They were ready to be mounted in the machine without the need for any post-processing. Uh, just to be clear, these parts are printed on the studio system, the low volume machine you see behind me here. Cheaper, 75% lower price. They're able to print these for just 15 euros compared to 60 euros and less waste, of course, because we're not having to do this subtractive uh, manufacturing processes like machining where you're wasting a lot of material. One thing I wanna point out about this part is that this is a perfect example of a geometry that is now accessible thanks to metal 3D printing. A geometry this simple, you could never justify with a laser powder infusion machine because it would just be far too expensive to justify using that technology. You would just end up machining it instead. But for this company, they can produce six samples in four days at just 15 euros per part. It really makes sense for them to do this versus having to you know, go to an outside vendor to have to have their machinist program and set up fixturing and have stock in house. All they have to do is load the file on the printer and in four days they have six of these parts ready to go into the machine. So this is a great example of one of these parts that is now possible thanks to this lower barrier of entry. You know, it would have been possible in the past it's a part that you can produce via traditional manufacturing, but for the first time, you can actually justify printing it and you can compete or exceed uh, the cost and throughput of what you would get from traditional manufacturing. Now we're looking at an example of a part on the shop system that you can see behind me here. This is where we're starting to move into some higher volume production. Uh, this is an output pulley. It's for a, a seatbelt retraction mechanism in a car. Uh, you can see this is kind of a cool geometry. It has some sliders and some undercuts involved in it. But here on the shop system, we can print 793 of these parts per build uh, at a cost of just $5.86 per part. So you can see we're really starting to crank up the volume of production, really starting to bring down the cost to justify actually producing these end use geometries. You can see we can produce over 5,500 of these parts per week to really allow for mass production with the shop system. Uh, one more geometry here to show you. Uh, this is on the production system. You can see it features that nice uh, lattice structure inside of the part. It's a herringbone gear. Uh, again, this part's able to be produced for just $13, and you can produce over 240 of these parts per build with a throughput of over 400,000 of these per year. So you can see really cranking up the throughput, really cranking down the cost to actually justify going to high volume manufacturing with metal 3D printing. All right, that's gonna wrap it up for the slides. I have a bunch of appendix slides if you wanna jump into uh, anything else, you know, as questions come up. But at this time, I'm happy to take some questions and let's talk about, uh, answer any questions people have. And yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea of what additive manufacturing 2.0 is. Cheers, Evan. Well, we're definitely live as uh, a little glitch earlier illustrated. Um, but perhaps could you just uh, maybe show um, that gear again? Because I'm not sure if everyone got a good look at it. When oh, the yeah. Was... So, yeah. Just so, so everyone what... knows, I, I have tons of cool parts with me here on my desk. I'll be showing off and talking about them as I talk about. Uh, this is a part that was printed on the production system. You can see, you know, we're getting you know, really nice surface quality, you know, excellent feature resolution, but really driving down the cost. Where now this part can be produced for just $13. I can print 400,000 of these per year that I can actually go to market with a geometry that looks like this, which gets me really excited because this is the stuff that Laser Powder Bit Fusion has been doing for years, but maybe they would print five of these for some special machine they're building. Mm -hmm. But now we can print hundreds of these parts per day to actually go to end use parts that you and I will interact with every day uh, with these optimized geometries, which is which is really, really exciting. But again, I got lots of these nice geometries on my desk here uh, that we can continue to talk about and I'll show off as, as okay. we come up. Well, look, let's, let's maybe sort of, obviously, AM is versatile technology. And you know, even at desktop, you've got a couple of different um, aspects of it. And then Additive 2.0, it's all about like moving away from this high cost, low volume um, and slow process time. Um, so this obviously broadens the horizons a lot further than, um, than the old sort of additive system. So with that in mind, what verticals um, is desktop metal really sort of looking to um, address and um, help people out with, uh, with Additive 2.0? Yeah, so one, one place that we're already seeing having tons of success is in the metal injection molding industry and parts that are traditionally produced via metal injection molding. Uh, if you're not familiar with metal injection molding, powder metal process, we use very similar materials, it's a similar process, but instead of printing 
those, uh, those parts, you're injecting that material into a mold. As you can imagine, those molds are very, very expensive. Uh, so to justify producing parts in those quantities, generally you have to move to very, very high volumes, uh, hundreds of thousands of parts per year to justify that 20, 30, $40,000 mold. Uh, so for any part that needs to be produced in lower volume than that, you know, we can produce, as I just showed you, you know, thousands of these parts per week without the need for any tooling. So we're seeing lots of interest for this in, you know, the automotive industry, in the consumer product industry, where currently they would love to metal injection mold parts because they like the properties, they like the finish, they like the, uh, the, the, the process in general, but they just can't justify it for many volumes and they don't want to be locked into this expensive tool. They want to have the ability to change the design at any time, to be tweaking the design at any time. Uh, so, they, so this is one industry that's seen a lot of benefit to. Another, I would say, is, you know, the casting industry, especially with die casting, very similar conversation, but with die casting, you can imagine very, very expensive investment in tooling. So they really don't want to have to uh, invest in this tooling before they really have, you know, they, unless they know they're going to move to these very high volumes. So even quantities of 10,000, even 100,000, you can justify with metal 3D printing before moving to a very, very expensive tool. So tooling for the manufacturing is an excellent uh, benefit over traditional. Um, I think we've got a few questions coming in before we get to them. Maybe, um, do you have any examples of uh, sure. those aut automotive? Yeah, um, yeah. So let me pull up. About. I have some uh, appendix slides here that I prepared. Here we go. So let, me, uh, let me flip through this a little bit. So, yeah. So here's a good example of a... This is a component of a parking brake bracket mm -hmm. for your actual uh, parking brake <coughs> bar to make sure you don't roll down the hill. But again, this part's printed on the production system. It would have required a very, very complex die uh, to produce. And then it would also would have required quite a bit of uh, secondary processing to, to actually produce these features that cannot be built into the die. But of course, with uh, metal 3D printing, we can simply just print it on the tree, just load it on the printer. This part can be produced for just $4.71 to produce over 340 of these parts per build, over 500,000 of these parts per year. Um, so a good example there. I have a few more. You've, you've seen a lot of these. I'm trying to find uh, one specific geometry. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, just just this stator here. You can see this is a good one to have it. You know, this is part of a small electric motor, but again, on the production system, able to produce these for just four dollars and forty eight cents, over four hundred thousand of these parts per year. So really, really driving uh, that cost down and really allowing for high volume production. It's pretty pretty interesting. Got a got a question question here that says, um, "How confident are you to use these parts on your vehicle?" Uh, yeah, so that's that's one thing that is true with any new technology is that there obviously is validation involved. That's true when you're moving to any new technology. But our properties is one thing to know is that we are very similar to the metal injection molding industry. All of our materials meet or exceed the standards of that industry. So anywhere that you're using a metal injection molded part today, you can really do a direct replacement to one of our geometries. Obviously, you're going to want to do some testing. You know, we're not going to start printing you know, engine pistons today, uh, where it's just a part that's, you know, extremely critical, extremely uh, important and extremely high stress. But for these lower force parts, for these geometries that are not, you know, critical to, uh, you know, life and death, really great applications and cost savings available with uh, metal 3D printing. Okay, another question that's uh, risen to the top. Um, remember, you can uh, you can vote on the questions you'd like to see answered. And uh, number one at the moment is, um, can you tell us more about the materials available on the production system, please? One really exciting thing about the production system is that the production system is an open source uh, printer. This means that you can purchase your materials from whatever powder supplier you choose. This is really a decision we made uh, because that system is really designed to be production. It's a production system. You're not going to tell the Fords of the world and the BMWs of the world and, and the largest metal injection molding companies of the world like Indomim that they have to use a certain powder because they've been using powders for 20, 30, 40 years since metal injection molding first started. So they already have existing suppliers. They have people they want to buy from. Uh, so they can really use any powders they want to. But a caveat to that is that those powders are then going to have to be qualified by them. 
they're going to have to develop the recipes. They're going to have to develop the print profiles themselves to ensure that they're getting parts out of that, which, you know, for them, they are qualified to do that. They have, you know, material scientists, they have metallurgists on their team mm -hmm. that are very equipped to do that. But for everyone else, you know, maybe a mom and pop machine shop that are, is not equipped to do that. We have something like the shop system where the materials are going to come from us. Uh, the materials, the powders are sold by us, uh, which, allows them to very, very easily and quickly get started immediately producing these beautiful parts because they don't have to do any tinkering. They simply load their file, they use our settings, we know what powder's in the system and we know it's gonna print beautiful parts every time. So production system is completely open source. Mm -hmm. On the top system today, it's just 17.4 pH stainless steel. Uh, the next materials will be 316L and cobalt chrome uh, will be mm -hmm. available as well, which will open up a lot of dental applications for us. Uh, but those are the next materials, but 17.4 pH we started with just because it's a great general purpose steel, allows for a lot of different uh, applications because it's a, just a really high quality stainless steel. But a couple of questions which are sort of all linked together, really. Um, the first of which is how do the mechanical properties of um, one of the steels that you, um, you print with compare to, say, a cast component? Great, yeah. So I was hoping that question would come up <laughs> because I have... Uh, let me just actually cover material properties in general. Uh, Great. Right? Yes, it's probably a good idea. Okay. Right. So let me just spend a, a minute here re reviewing this. So one thing that's important to know about these parts is that these parts do not have the same stigma as a, you know, for example, a plastic FDM printed part or a plastic SLA printed part because we are doing a sintering process. So the parts are printed layer by layer, but then there are you know, so what actually comes out of the furnace is what we're calling a green part. You can see that what I have here, this is printed on the studio system here. This is still relatively fragile. Uh, it's got about the consistency of a crayon. If I were to drop it, it would probably break. Uh, but what this is, is a combination of metal powder and binder like a glue. The only thing that's holding this together is those binders. I'm then going to put this part into a furnace. That furnace is first gonna remove all the binder and then it's gonna get just below the melting temperature of the material. That part's gonna shrink about 20%, like you're seeing here. And that part's gonna end up densifying because your metal particle particles are actually going to fuse together and densify. You can see the result is dense, strong metal. So because we're doing the sintering process, uh, we are able to produce isotropic parts because our particles are not just fusing in X and Y, like you see with you know a traditional metal or traditional 3D printing process, but they're also able to fuse in Z. So we're getting actual you know isotropic properties. You don't have different strengths along the Z axis because of printing. And the history of the part and its powder metal origins have actually been completely erased because the grains of metal have grown larger than the original powder particles were. Uh, the particles have fused together and necked and, and removed any porosity in the part to produce these very, very dense uh, geometries. And it's this homogeneous microstructure that actually allows these parts to be very, very attractive for end use applications. Uh, because obviously, anisotropic parts are, are very, very difficult to understand. It's difficult to understand the failure. But when your part is isotropic, like with our sintering process, it, it's really excellent for a wide variety of industrial applications. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our materials do exceed, meet or exceed the standards from ASTM or MPIF. Uh, so this is an example of that 17.4 pH that's printed on the shop system. You can see the yield strength there is about 660 megapascals. The MPI, MPIF 35 standard is about 650. So we're exceeding that uh, when it comes to the H900 heat treatment. Of course, these parts are fully compatible with traditional finishing operations. So the part was put into an H900 heat treatment, and now we are able to raise that yield strength all the way up to you know 981. Uh, which is, you know, exceeding again, if you're looking at the elongation at break, we're exceeding those properties quite a bit. One important thing to know, all of these data sheets are available on our website for every material that we print. Uh, so if you're curious to see how these materials actually perform compared to what you're using today, head to our website, download whatever data sheets you want, uh, just to give you, you know, just so I don't know if anyone out there is trying to take notes on this or scribble this stuff down, go ahead and download those data sheets. So one good example of this is this gear component. This is an oil and gas component. It's part of a, a pulley system for a smart control valve. Uh, the customer here wanted to re reproduce the part that they were producing via investment casting, but they wanted to switch to a binder jet component. Uh, just a little bit about the metrics of this part. It cost them about $18 to print this part. 
They could do about 114 of them per build and, and they could do about almost 800 of them per week. So the customer did do some testing of this geometry because they wanted to see how it was gonna perform compared to a traditional cast component. So in order to qualify this part, the customer needed it to be able to cycle at least 1 million times and also withstand 273 inch pounds of torque. Uh, so what do they do? Of course, they were gonna test this part and you can see the results here. Uh, the cast component was able to withstand 350 inch pounds of torque, while the binder jet component was able to withstand 429 inch pounds of torque. Uh, torque. Uh, when it came to the fatigue requirements, uh, they were able to withstand 1 million cycles. Uh, the cast component did pass, but there was quite a lot of deformation on it. The binary jet component, on the other hand, passed with little to no deformation of the part. So it really exceeded the properties of that cast component. So this is a good example of a real world customer. I can't mention their name, but they did, they were okay with us using these results to show uh, you know, some of the parts that are actually exceeding the properties of an investment cast component in 17.4 pH stainless steel. So hopefully that answers some questions about material properties as well as how they compare to a cast component. Yeah, that's definitely covered off a few of the uh, questions um, regarding the isotropic parts and those properties as well versus the uh, cast um, parts. Uh, questions now at the top though is um, what kind of tolerances are achievable? Yeah, so this is a very common question we get. And one thing to know about this process is that where we lose our tolerances is during the sintering process. We can print, you know, very, very precisely, we can print where our, uh, you know, material is actually being laid down, where the binder is being laid down, but predicting this shrink can be somewhat of a challenge. You know, it is very, very consistent. So we do use consistent shrink rates, uh, you know, about 20% generally, our software takes care of all that for you. Uh, we're very comfortable with about a 1% tolerance. Uh, so if you need better than that, you can, just, you can use, you know, machining or other post-processing processes to get critical dimensions. But one thing that I want to uh, quickly show you is this process that we have called Live Center. This is a software product that Desktop Metal has. It comes with all of our binder jetting machines. And what this does is it actually predicts and simulates what the part is going to experience in the furnace. Uh, during that actual shrinkage, uh, you know, the part experiences some forces. There's, you know, obviously friction dragging along the bottom. There's gravity involved. And those forces can, you know, cause distortion. They can cause parts to warp. They can cause parts to come out not the way you want them to, to lose our tolerances that we're trying to achieve. So what Live Center does is it first takes your geometry. It scales it up by, you know, a relatively known scale factor, maybe 20%. And it predicts that shrinkage. It predicts it in the furnace and it sees how closely does it get after that sintering cycle to what we want? It then analyzes that and negatively distorts the geometry to then try again to see how much better can we get. It's then gonna iterate a few times, I think we do five or six different iterations to achieve a final deformed result that you're then going to print. So this is no longer a static you know, XYZ scaling, it's dynamic across all points in the mesh. So for example, that this geometry you're seeing on the right, what you're actually going to print is the what's above because the simulation saw that those feet want to bow out during the, during the sintering process because of friction. So let's print them a little bit bowed in. So that way during the sintering process, they bow out to being straight. So this really helps us achieve even better dimensions uh, than a 1% than tolerance. It's not needed on all geometries. It, it is for some of the more challenging geometries, but very, very quickly it allows you to achieve these excellent tolerances uh, a question we get a lot, this is something that's actually very unique to desktop metal as well, <laughs> is this entering simulation process and the ability to produce these, uh, these, these negative offsets. It, it looks a little funny when you print them, you're like, that's going to shrink to that. <laughs> and then you put it in the furnace and it comes out and it, the part looks beautiful and everything's straight. Uh, so it's, it is a cool, really cool software product. I mean, tied, tied into this as well, I think, is um, there's a question about how um, the support generation process is managed. And... Um, and then that tacked onto that is a bit about post-processing, but let's look at the support generation because- um... Sure, so supports you know, can be needed depending on the geometry, depending on if there's overhangs and things like that. For binder jetting processes like the shop system, we're much more concerned about supports in the sintering process than we are about printing. Since we are printing in a bed of powder, that powder does do a decent job of supporting the parts. Um, but during the sintering process, if you have you know, a huge overhang, you do want to be careful uh, that that overhang doesn't droop. So we do have a software product called Fabricate MFG. Uh, 
that's going to automatically generate supports for you. It has all of our parameters in it. It's going to look for overhangs, look for geometries that need supports, and automatically generate that support for you. You do also have the option to create your own custom supports if you just want to do that in CAD. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, if, for example, if you have an overhang, you know you might need a, a bar up to, to stop that from drooping. And you know, we have some set parameters to help you design those supports mm -hmm. if you want to design your supports yourself. Uh, the supports that we generate in our software are pretty optimized and they also have uh, honeycomb in them as well to make sure you're utilizing as little material as possible because we do print supports in the same uh, material as the final part to ensure that it all shrinks consistently. Between the support and the actual part, we put a layer of ceramic just to ensure that that support doesn't actually sinter to your part mm -hmm. so that after printing, it's easy to remove. You just pull it off. Uh, yep. I have an example here. So this is a support structure for uh, this geometry here. This is on the studio system. So you can see, you know, just do it for that overhang. But after sintering is complete, I just I just pull it off the part. Yes, uh, so I've, I've seen that before and it snap away very easily. Yeah, this is something I actually think it's, you know, uh, I've been printing a lot with DLP lately because Desktop Metal just uh, acquired Envision Tech and you know, playing with those support structures and, and it's really <laughs> given me a appreciation for just how easy it is in this process where they just pop right off the supports. I bet. Yeah, we've got a couple of link questions here. So um, the first one is, um, has live center software been validated and if so, how? Yeah, so it has been validated through quite a few designs of experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, the head of this is uh, someone named Andy Roberts, who is, is a really smart guy here at Desktop Metal who pioneered this technology. And the way we validated it is just, you know, doing a lot of testing and then doing a, a ton of scanning and doing a ton of CMM to validate that the dimensions were coming out better and the properties were coming out better as well. You can also tune this software. So if a part comes out and it does not meet, you know, what it needed, the way this was developed was through feeding this uh, software lots of different scan data to understand how geometries were deforming and to understand how parts were experiencing different form, uh, different forces and different geometries. So the way it's been validated is through lots of testing, lots of designs of experiments to show that the parts we're producing were better tolerances mm -hmm. uh, than they were without the software. And it's really being used by almost all of our management and customers. If you start to kind of learn, for example, I don't know if, how well you can see this rocket. I'm going to pop. Let's, let's go back to the mode. In the chair. Yep. Okay, so let me. Let's go back to this So this mode, so we... rocket that was printed on the shop system. This was printed with no support structures because of the, the use of live center. As you can imagine, in the furnace, you know, I don't know how well this is focusing, but all of these different teeth would want to droop down, correct? Because, you know, there's gravity. These are heavy. When it's shrinking, mm. when it's turning into metal, they're going to want to droop down. So the way this was printed was with all of these sprockets facing up a little bit because live centers saw that that was going to happen. So it printed them all a little bit mm -hmm. till so that as they're shrinking in the furnace, they come out very nice and straight, as you can see. This is a really impressive geometry. Nice. Um, so yeah. You can imagine how you would produce this traditionally out of a bunch of different parts and then weld it together versus just printing it all as one piece. Uh, and it's also quite thin wall, which is mm -hmm. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so it was linked into that question about... Um, validation we have a question here about whether the printers have um astm or slash iso certifications uh i'm i'm not positive on that I, i'll have to follow up with you on that and, and ask some people on our material science team but mm -hmm. i know that we are validating all this process as well as the world of metal 3d printing is still quite new a lot of these technologies are new i know uh we have some people here who are on the new standards boards for this and are helping to develop what are the standards for a monitor component? Yeah. What are the ASTM and ISO standards? Because this is a relatively new technology. So I, I'll have to follow up with you uh, on that, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I know it's something that we're working very hard to validate it and, and to pioneer. Great. Great. I think that's just a reminder as well that there will be a networking session after this um, presentation. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to talk about in groups, um, such as development of standards, for example, that will be uh, taking place after we wrap this up. Um, here's a question which I think was probably triggered by looking at the um, support materials. Can your printers use um, ceramic powders to 3D print? Uh, yes, potentially. For in parts or just for support? Or for, at the moment, just support, so not for... Uh, in, the, in the moment, uh, our printers are not printing ceramics. 
Mm. But I, I know it's uh, I know it's of great interest. So cool. I bet it is. Um, is another one. Is is composite metal um, printing possible? Uh, multi multi metals. Yeah. So multi metal is not overly compatible or is not compatible with this process because of this sintering process. Sintering mm. has very set temperatures and hold times for different alloys. That when you start to mix and match different materials. Uh, you're going to start to have materials that are sintering at lower temperatures versus higher temperatures and allow them to not be overly compatible with the sintering process. Mm -hmm. This is actually one of the big challenges of working with aluminum and sintering is that aluminum uh, oxidizes very quickly to alumina surrounding aluminum. And alumina actually sinters at a different temperature than aluminum does, which can be very, very challenging to sinter because your aluminum wants to melt at a much lower temperature than your alumina does, allowing it to making it very, very difficult to sinter which is something that you know, I think a lot of people are working on, but is, is, is definitely a challenge of these composite materials of, of sintering them. Mm, I bet. Um, someone here might have missed the start of the presentation, but what um, print technology do your printers use? Sure, so let me, let me just pull up again. Um, sorry that I keep going in and out of slides. Hopefully it's not too distracting. No, it's, um, for me, it's, it's fine, but um, here we go with the next bit. Okay, so let me show, uh, sure. So we're really today we're talking about three different printers. The one behind me here is the studio system. This is what we call bound metal deposition. So I actually have one of these rods here with me today. Oh, actually I have some, uh, some slides on this. I came prepared. So, <laughs> uh, so this is kind of comparing to that metal injection molding process. So the studio system is a process called bound metal deposition. So what we're extruding is these rods. You can see I have one with me here today. This rod is a combination of metal powder and polymer binder. Uh, so this is fully encased in a wax actually. So it's safe to handle. There's no loose metal powders, which of course is a concern for office environments. Then we're actually just extruding this through a nozzle the same way you would as an FDM process. So we're building up our parts layer by layer, utilizing these metal powders, uh, mixed with this binder and all that's being melted during the extrusion process is the binder component. It's allowing that metal powder to flow and take form like you're seeing here. We're then going to place this part into the furnace. The furnace removes that binder and it centers the part into a dense, strong metal part that you're seeing here. So that's an FDM process combined with a sintering process. We call it bound metal deposition because this is bound metal and we're depositing it. Then we have our binder jetting systems. Uh, so that's the, gonna be the shop system and the production system. This is also a sintering process, but instead of using you know, a simple extrusion base, we use binder jetting. So binder jetting is a, a technology that's been around. It's actually one of the first pioneered uh, 3D printing technologies to ever exist. Uh, the way traditional binder jetting works, then I'll briefly explain how our systems differentiate. Traditional binder jetting works by laying down a layer of powder. You're then going to spread and compact that powder with a roller. You then do deposition via scanning, uh, which is very similar to if maybe if you have an at-home 2D inkjet printer where your print head goes back and forth to lay down the ink on top of your piece of paper. You know, generally that's how that's done. But with, instead of laying down ink, you're laying down a binder to hold the, that powder together, you know, in the shape of your part. You then do a drawing layer. So this is, you know, has worked in the past. It's relatively slow though. So what Desktop Metal pioneered is this idea of single pass jetting, where rather than doing uh, the scanning operation, we have a print bar that spans the entire width of the build volume. And in just one pass, <laughs> it's gonna lay down that entire layer. So as you can imagine, that's much, much, much faster than the scanning process because we're able to print entire layers in just one pass. The production system actually takes all four steps and combines them into one. Uh, you know, this is a quite a big, this is quite a big machine. It has quite a big print head in the front of that print head is actually going to be depositing a constant wave of metal powder. It's then going to immediately be compacted right behind that wave. And then it's going to immediately lay down binder right behind that. Uh, this system doesn't actually need a drying step. And then that print head is actually going to be able to is symmetric around the center. So it actually works in both directions allowing for there to never be any wasted movement. Uh, the production system can print an entire layer in about four seconds. So it's very, very, very fast, allowing for, you know, really, really high volume production. 
So hopefully that makes some sense. That was kind of a long-winded answer. Uh, the studio system, bound metal deposition, you're extruding these metal rods via FDM and then sintering them. The chop system, the production system are binder jetting systems. You're jetting binder onto metal powder and putting them into furnaces to sinter. No, great answer. And um, I just uh, maybe a quick question here. Would this work with polymer powders with a high melting temperature? Uh, there is definitely research being into done with that. I know, I know with some composites and some other, uh, some other materials that it, it is com potentially compatible with that. Uh, so it is something that's, that's being looked into. I, I know, uh, you know, the actual binder jetting process is, is quite similar to, uh, you know, maybe what HP does in multi-jet fusion, mm -hmm. but rather than, you know, having to go into a furnace, they're able to do all the, all the drying and fusing mm -hmm. actually in the printer itself. So there is definitely some look at doing this with polymers as well. Okay, a um, couple more questions. So how do you characterize your materials um, in order to pre-qualify a part? Yeah, so our characterization goes through the same uh, validation that you would with in the metal injection molding industry. So we have a really extensive material science team here. They do lots of printing of tensile bars of different dog bones, different geometries to then do extensive testing of, uh, you know, in a Instron machine to do tensile mm -hmm. testing, yield testing, all that validation uh, here in house to make sure that we're abiding by the same uh, standards and requirements of the MPI, MPIF standards, which they have set validation standards for us to follow, I believe. Okay. Um, here's a question from Brian Crotty at RPM, which is what percentage of the parts are you doing one machine, one serial product versus switching every day, week or month to different part types? Yeah, so I think we have, we have quite a few customers who have purchased machines to operate more as a service bureau kind of model where one week they may get an order for a thousand parts and they, the whole week they're spent printing that thousand parts. The next week they may get an order for five different geometries of 10 of each. So they'll put all those into a build box together. So that's one big advantage of the system of course is that it's so agile, it's tooling free that you can do something like a thousand of one part or you can do something like you know, five different parts and print 50 of each of them in, in the same build box. So we're, we're seeing a, a wide range of both. But on the other side of things, we have companies like, you know, a defense, you know, defense contractor or someone like a, I shouldn't say any names, but we have <laughs> companies that are just large engineering companies and they have machine shops, they have manufacturing in house. And this is another tool to produce parts for their engineers. So every week, you know, engineers are submitting parts to the queue. They run the system overnight a couple times a week, and they're spitting out hundreds of parts for to support lots of different teams around the building, uh, which is something that is really allowing machines uh, to produce <laughs> lots of parts. I, I know personally, when I uh, worked in industry, my background's in mechanical engineering, you know, I would wait three weeks to get relatively simple parts out of the machine shop. So I think a lot of machine shops are realizing this is a great tool to help their engineers get parts much, much faster because it's hands off. They can pack a bunch of parts into the build, print it overnight, and there's really very little user interaction to produce these relatively or very high quality metal parts. Okay, and the last um, question or questions really all relate to cost. So what can you say about the price? Yeah, sure. This is something that always comes up. Uh, we do feel that the price is very competitive. Uh, on the studio system, that's generally going to cost you around 200,000 USD. That's an all in cost. So that's going to come with the printer, the furnace, everything you need to get up and running to produce, you know, metal parts. The shop system does have a few more uh, pieces of equipment to it. It has depowdering stations and vacuums, some, some mixers and things like that for the metal powder, uh, a few pieces of equipment there. It also comes with a furnace. Uh, one, Oh, so let me give you a price first. That system to go all in for, for what you're going to need is going to be more like 450,000 USD, but that's going to allow you to produce, you know, thousands of parts per year. Uh, one important thing to know is you can see behind me here in the middle, that is the furnace that Desktop Metal has created. That furnace is compatible with both the shop system and the studio system. So the studio system actually came out first. We have lots of customers who bought it. They love their studio system. When the shop system came out, they wanted one of those too, and they didn't have to buy the furnace again, which saved them quite a bit of money because the furnace, as you can imagine, is, is quite an expensive piece mm -hmm. of equipment. So important thing to know is that that system, that furnace is compatible with both the shop system as well as the studio system. When it comes to the production system, that's a much more industrial machine. Uh, that's looking at more in, in the million dollar range uh, for full capacity to really produce, but that's really talking 
you know, millions of parts per year, really, really high production. Excellent. Um, well, I hope that's answered everybody's questions for now. And what we're going to do next is we're going to switch over to the um, networking session um, where um, Evan and um, will be available to answer other questions um, about um, anything which we didn't manage to get to in depth with our sort of real run through there. But, so, um, Evan, thanks very much for your time today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. Uh, hopefully, people come and network. I'm always happy to chat with everyone. Great. Well, um, hopefully see a few of you over there. Bye for now.